Yeah. Um, do you see a presentation and uh, visualizer with pen? All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, today we will start um, to gain real um, fruits out of our development. So far, we was mainly investing our time in study of the Heisenberg group itself. Now we uh, will harvest results and that will go um, at really fast uh, pace just because we uh, made quite a lot of substantial preparation so far. So um, we are going to discuss um, application of uh, Heisenberg group uh, to quantum mechanics and um, uh, for quantum mechanics in fact we <clears throat> not only Uh, for quantum mechanics, we are not only uh, have uh, uh, useful technique, but we also, on every step, will see a connection with mathematical theory, with theory of uh, certain operators, operators in the Hilbert space related uh, to quantum mechanical models. And practically, it's very difficult to separate um, where we have just a physical application of the Heisenberg group and where we are uh, seeing certain uh, mathematical, pure mathematical results. We are so closely intertwined in this field, what um, it may be even a wrong attitude to try to separate mathematics from physics here. So uh, speaking about quantum mechanics, I would like to uh, drop out immediately the question of interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, because this is a uh, quite a um, uh, hot topic uh, 100 years after it was invented. We still have a lot of discussions how we should interpret ob observer apparatus, uh, what is uh, uh, possible violation of Bell inequalities and do, do we have superluminal propagation of a signal, other things. So uh, in this, uh, for the purpose of this course, we will adopt uh, Richard Feynman uh, approach, shut up and calculate. So we will just um, use a certain mathematical model and uh, we'll uh, obtain uh, uh, results which will be uh, related to particular uh, quantum mechanical systems. So how that shall be interpreted is not uh, a topic for a discussion here in this course. And uh, in fact, uh, all that uh, uh, results which we will obtain will be of a rather general nature. So uh, because the quantum mechanics again uh, was a um, quite uh, debatable area, uh, so people try to avoid the uh, problems or quantum mechanical paradox by inventing uh, different type of descriptions, difficult, uh, dip, different type of models for quantum mechanics. But each time whenever they uh, get a reasonably full uh, description of uh, a known effect, all time it's turned out what, what we obtained uh, was one way or another just a reinterpretation, a different restatement of the previous mathematical model which is related to um, operators in the Hilbert space. And we already met one, uh, such one uh, such interpretation uh, or uh, model which uh, look a little bit different. Um, that was collected with the Moyle bracket commutator uh, defined on the functions uh, uh, by means of twisted convolution uh, and um, initial attempt was um, to state quantum mechanics not in the term of operators but rather in term of uh, certain functions on the uh, phase space and uh, associate a right operation to this uh, function on the phase space which allowed to uh, treat that function not as observables for classical system as usually function on the phase space R but rather uh, observables for a quantum system and as soon as uh, that um, Moyle bracket was introduced uh, uh, the theory from that point immediately became 
isomorphic to the theory of operator on the Hilbert space, just as we demonstrated before, <clears throat> Moyle bracket appears from operators of convolutions, so we have explicit intertwining operator with the Heisenberg uh, Schrodinger model of the quantum mechanics. So, what will be our uh, uh, formalism, mathematical formalism for the quantum mechanics? Uh, really, uh, the approach which we are developing is equally uh, well suited for both quantum and classical mechanics. And we will uh, say what a system is described by certain state. And uh, that state uh, may change over time naturally, so we are usually observe uh, changes of the world around us, and so we are <clears throat> want to describe states as a function of time. And for quantum mechanics, it's uh, common to accept what uh, the state, quantum state, is described by a vector in a Hilbert space, or if we um, uh, put a reasonable uh, uh, restriction what it is shall be a vector of the unit norm when we rather need to speak about the uh, projective space associated to the Hilbert space H. When, uh, when we are measuring uh, certain physical quantity on a particular state, even for the classical system our measurement, uh, measurements never are precise we always get certain uh, statistical distribution. So whenever, for example, you are measuring the speed of a bullet from a gun, so you do like uh, 10 or 100 shots and then uh, just uh, calculate time and uh, divide, uh, which bullet take to travel certain distance. When you uh, find out what uh, each experiment produce a different value, so you make an average that will produce a mathematical expectation for you, and you are also interested what will be the dispersion, how much individual measurements are far from mathematical expectation. So it uh, happened even for a very classical uh, system, so uh, nothing changed uh, in uh, tra uh, transition to the quantum world, so we are claiming what physical observables in, in, uh, measured in quantum uh, states also produce a certain expectation value. And that expectation value is calculated on a state which is given by a vector phi and uh, operator A which represents an observable by this highlighted formula. So uh, we just uh, make an inner product of phi with uh, phi transferred, uh, tra uh, changed by operator A. So, <clears throat> if we have a possibility to measure mathematical expectation for uh, the any observable, the important observable which need to be measured is quadratic deviation, dispersion, from the average. And that is given by such a formula of course, if we uh, use the previous agreement, or uh, manipulating a little bit with operators and in a product, we see that dispersion is given by that expression 46. So we have uh, uh, square of the norm for uh, operator A minus expectation of A applied to the state phi. And uh, here is an important special case. If there is an eigenvector uh, for certain operator A, when uh, measurement produced on this operator, according to the formula 47, will have a zero dispersion. So on that pure state, on exact state, which is eigenvalue for A, we get uh, exact uh, measurement result. Even in the quantum world, uh, theoretically, there is the possibility to uh, obtain exact measurement if we are uh, somehow able to produce a pure state in our uh, experiments. Now, uh, let's uh, move further 
and um, uh, consider the simplest possible uh, quantum mechanical system. Assume we have a particle which is uh, with configurational uh, space being a real line. So our function may uh, be located at any point of the real line. So uh, how to make a measurement where our function is located? So we uh, take the Hilbert space of a square integrable functions on the real line. These square integrable functions um, will present uh, states of our physical system. When according <clears throat> to the natural uh, expectation, how we need to find uh, the uh, or how interpretation of this function on the real line will be done. So uh, consider formula 47 for a moment <clears throat> and assume here there is no uh, Q in front of F and uh, integration is done only over a subset of R. So in, in integration in this case will return how much of our function is uh, supported on that subspace of R, uh, subset of R, on that small portion. So um, uh, that uh, function F, uh, called in this context wave function, is uh, produce the density or probability uh, for a particle to be located on certain uh, subset of a real line. When if we would like to find the average of uh, or expectation for uh, coordinate out of a distribution, we need that density which give distribution <coughs> of uh, our particle over the line uh, to be multiplied by the value of corresponding coordinate Q. So when calculation given by that formula 47 will return mathematical expectation for coordinate of the particle uh, on the real line with given probability distribution over the real line. Now we want to connect it with the uh, Heisenberg group, that operator, and we recall what we considered on the real line, the Schrodinger representation, and there is one dimensional subgroup generated by element 0, 1, 0 in the Lie algebra, Weyl algebra of the Heisenberg group. When a representation of corresponding one parameter subgroup is given by multiplication with exponent, with multiplication, <clears throat> and a corresponding derived representation where we uh, derive one parameter subgroup with respect to its parameter is given by this formula. So that is calculation which we did before. Now uh, we just see that uh, that operator <clears throat> uh, which we need operator of multiplication by Q can be expressed as a factor, uh, a scalar factor i divided by 2 pi over from the derived representation for subgroup x. So subgroup x, uh, here generator x, just um, produce for us operator of coordinate of quantum system. Now uh, let's look for the adjoint coordinates, momentum. So a physical system can be characterized not only by a coordinate of the particle, but also by its velocity, or uh, rather we will better speak about momentum, which is roughly the product of velocity by mass. <clears throat> when uh, we may uh, connect the semi-group uh, of uh, uh, shifts, velocity of a particle means what coordinate is changed. So we have a group of shifts which correspond to velocity. The bigger velocity we have, the larger shift over a unit of time is produced. So the corresponding subgroup which generate observables related to momentum will be obtained from derived representation of the um, subgroup uh, with component Y. So here uh, the operator <clears throat> which we see 
uh, which came in that con context, is exactly I times that derived representation. So, uh, as we know, uh, so uh, we obtain uh, two important quantum mechanical operators, coordinate and momentum, uh, as derived representation uh, for the elements of the veil algebra. Uh, it's time to recall what these generators in the veil algebra has a non-zero commutator. They have a commutator which is equal to the uh, uh, generator of the center of the Heisenberg group. So, uh, in the representation, corresponding operator of the center uh, came to the uh, multiple of a scalar. So, as usually in irreducible representation, uh, representation uh, of the commutative sub group will be just a multiple of a scalar. In our case, that multiple is just i times the parameter h bar, which will be interpreted as a Planck constant. Now, uh, there is quite general statement which um, describe what non-zero commutators between operator lead to inequality 51 and if you will come back uh, to a couple of slides before where is it so a couple of slides before we uh, said what exactly this expression was responsible for the dispersion of the uh, quantum mechanical uh, measurement. So, that essentially tells us what the commutator of two operators produce certain uncertainty, uh, exactness of measurement of particular variable, as we already said, theoretically may be equal, dispersion may be equal to zero, we may get exact measurement even in the quantum world for one particular observable, but uh, for observable which does not commute with given one, in this case we need to obtain very large, almost infinite, uh, the uncertainty to, in order to satisfy that inequality. So, let's see, the proof of that inequality is a simple algebra, <clears throat> is very straightforward, uh, so, uh, we just expand the uh, right-hand side of inequality with commutator uh, using linearity of inner product and trivial <coughs> presentation. We obtain uh, the identity 52. Now, we are using Cauchy-Schwarz inequality uh, to make an estimation what inner product here in 52 can be estimated by the product of the norm of corresponding vectors. Uh, here is that proof even suggest where we may, uh, the point vectors where that inequality turn out into identity. So, where we obtain exact uh, identity here, the lowest bound is attained if and only if two vectors here in that uh, inner product are linear, so if a multiple one of another. So, that actually uh, reflected in our statement. In our statement, we said what <coughs> identity holds only for vectors which are null solution for that particular equation <coughs> in terms of operators A and B. So, let us come to our uh, representation related to the Heisenberg group. So, for the Heisenberg group, commutator of M and D is constant. So, that is always um, produce inner product uh, to be um, no less than Planck constant over 2. And identity happen if and only if we have a solution of this particular uh, equation with substitution uh, of values for operator M and D which we had before, we obtain the uh, first order differential equation with respect to function phi 
And that first order differential equation has unique solution up to uh, the constant, and that solution is a uh, Gaussian. So at some point before when we discussed uh, wavelet transform, which lead to fox siegel bergman transform as mother wavelets, we uh, used the uh, Gaussian, and it was promised what uh, the reason why Gaussian appeared in that context will be explained later. So uh, now the time to give that explanation. So we are taking up Gaussian because it's minimized uncertainty on the measurement between the coordinate and momentum observable in quantum mechanics. So let us take a little bit closer look on the Gaussian because that function really is important uh, with, um, in many areas of mathematics and in context of the Heisenberg group its importance was revealed just on the previous slide. Uh, so <clears throat> we want to understand what happened with the Gaussian if it's taken as the mother wavelet. So we take Gaussian and apply to it the Schrodinger representation. And Schrodinger representation effectively uh, has two components or two uh, elements. One is shift and another <clears throat> is multiplication by certain uh, exponent. So shift, uh, it's easy to understand. So Gaussian itself look like um, that shape on the screen and it um, has um, uh, mass concentrated around zero. So that is uh, somehow give us localization of the uh, point in the zero position. When we are applying shift by different values, uh, when we effectively produce coherent states which represent a particle which may be localized at a different and another uh, position on the real line. So meaning of the shift here is just um, produce a certain localization uh, in the coordinate space. Um, a little bit later when we will introduce the Fourier transform we will see what second component, which in Schrodinger representation looks like multiplication by exponent, is really responsible <coughs> for the, uh, so here it looks like multiplication, but it will be responsible for the shift in the momentum space, really multiplying our Gaussian uh, in coordinate representation by with value, we are shifting it in momentum space. And so, uh, in fact, the Heisenberg group produced two shift. Shift in the, which is now completely geometrically obvious, this is shift on the coordinate space, and also it produced shift which will become later obvious, this is shift in the phase space. So, applying uh, Heisenberg group, we are able to obtain different coherent states which has <coughs> a certain localization uh, in the both coordinate and momentum. So we may produce average value, uh, mathematical expectation uh, for the state uh, with any uh, desirable value uh, pair of coordinate and momentum. <clears throat> well, uh, you may ask uh, why our Gaussian is um, so spread? Can we uh, get it a bit better localization if we will uh, get its shape uh, to be more pike-like around zero. So that also uh, may be interpreted in the uh, words of the coherent states. Uh, so uh, in this type we add additional transformation which is a scaling. So if we will come to the Heisenberg group so and uh, study its aftermorphism, we will see what we may uh, uh, scale elements of the Heisenberg group by certain value here <coughs> in this way. And when uh, our uh, Heisenberg group 
can be extended to the Schrodinger group by addition uh, to the Heisenberg group its aftermorphism, that uh, construction of semi-direct product which we consider it uh, when we uh, spoke, uh, in, we considered on more elementary example when we have spoke about the uh, IX plus B group. So uh, adding scaling to Gaussian really uh, indeed produce a better uh, localization uh, into coordinate space. So scaling, is, there is, uh, here is examples how we localize it. But that uh, happen on the expense of worse localization into the uh, momentum space. Whenever our Gaussian became more narrow in the coordinate space, its Fourier image, its image in the momentum space became more spread, more lean. So, and that is just follow from the Heisenberg um, uncertainty relation, which we, from that inequalities, which we discussed before. There is no way to localize well both uh, coordinate and momentum, so everything here is balanced. But that more general uh, type of wavelets, wavelets which appear from the Schrodinger group, uh, which semi-direct product of the Heisenberg group and its aftermorphism, uh, may be still useful in certain circumstances if, for example, we do are interested or we value more localization into the coordinate space and do not care much about localization in the momentum space, so that additional uh, freedom uh, to scale Gaussian may be indeed uh, valuable and useful for our construction. Um, now we want uh, to uh, address the following topic. We have already um, learned that the main property uh, one of the good main properties of the uh, covariant transform is that it produces intertwining operator between the initial representation <coughs> and left regular representation. So uh, if I apply here the left regular representation to the image of wavelet transform, that will be just correspond to initial representation rho in the uh, space which, uh, with the representation. Uh, now question uh, may be a silly one on the first glance. Uh, what if I apply the right regular representation here to the image of wavelet transform? What will happen if I will apply right regular representation. Well, the correct answer, what you cannot do that, uh, just because uh, image of the wavelet transform is invariant on the left shift, but is not invariant on the right shift. So when you put, uh, replace left regular representation by the right regular representation, you immediately uh, get out of the uh, space, which is image of the wavelet transform. Uh, but uh, the moment of reflection uh, demonstrate what uh, question still uh, get certain answer and that answer is given by the next proposition. The application <coughs> of the uh, right regular transform, uh, uh, right regular representation really produce a space which is uh, wavelet transform uh, with another mother wavelet. So that last identity 37 on the screen, it is telling, uh, it tells us what we, enlarge it a little bit. Yes, okay, so <clears throat> that identity 37 tell us what we may apply right regular representation and obtain something different uh, wavelet transform with a different mother wavelet. And that observation is rather helpful in many circumstances. We will see certain 
uh, advantages of that formula. So, uh, first of all, let's uh, pass to infinitesimal version of uh, the previous formula. So, if identity 37 uh, is uh, 57, sorry, sorry, uh, is uh, true for the initial representation, clearly it will be true for the derived version of both representations. So, if I derivate that identity with respect to uh, generators of certain semi-group, uh, so I will have derived right representation in the left-hand side and derived form of my representation row on the right-hand side. <clears throat> now, assume that my mother wavelet is annihilated by this operator of uh, in, uh, uh, corresponding derived representation. So, uh, that operator uh, A in this corollary. <clears throat> so, if in this case, of course, I will obtain the uh, wavelet transform with respect to zero mother wavelet, and uh, if you will come back to the formula which define wavelet transform, uh, so this is <clears throat> that identity when uh, zero mother wavelet here of course produce zero wavelet transform. That means what any <coughs> uh, uh, function in the image of the wavelet transform will be null solution to certain uh, first order differential operator related to the infinitesimal generators of the right shift. And if we will see uh, for the <coughs> Gaussian, uh, we already has an operator which is annihilating it. And we uh, get that operator when we consider the necessity for minim minimality of uncertainty. So we uh, found uh, what minimal uncertainty of coordinate and momentum will be achieved if a uh, function is annihilated by m minus factor d. <clears throat> and that is exactly what Gaussian satisfied to. So, that means what Maza, uh, when we do wavelet transform with the Gaussian, the image will be uh, annihilated by the operator which is given on the screen at the last line. This is uh, right action of uh, associated to uh, generator M and right plus right action are generated to the generator D. <clears throat> and that uh, operator, if you will do calculations on the corresponding homogeneous space, is exactly Cauchy-Riemann operator on the complex plane. That means when we are doing fox siegel bargman transform, the image of this wavelet transform consists of analytical function. So, as we can, uh, so in this way, you see uh, operator which uh, related to minimality of uncertainty produce uh, an operator which uh, define analyticity. So, that two uh, notion, one came uh, with strong uh, physical uh, flavor, another is purely mathematical uh, analyticity. So, they uh, came out just uh, two phases of the exactly the same uh, uh, equation. So, there is strong connection between them. <clears throat> well, uh, because uh, I have uh, certain mathematical nature, uh, my intention is to state a theorem which generalize the previous observation. So, uh, that uh, we, uh, previous statement was just about a Gaussian which minimizes uncertainty for coordinate and momentum. Of course, we can state it for a pair of any other operators. Whenever we have a state which minimizes uncertainty uh, for these two operators um, in the uh, corresponding model, when uh, wavelet transform uh, based on the minimal uncertainty state uh, will consist of functions which has, uh, which are null solution to certain 
uh, operator related to the right shift on the Heisenberg group. So in this case, we have a certain general statement, but uh, again, uh, most probably important, most interesting is, of course, the realization of this general statement for coordinate and momentum. Now, <clears throat> Let's come uh, to the uh, wavelet transform, which generated by the uh, Gaussian, and uh, to study uh, corresponding wavelet transform, we will need first to describe exactly properties of the Schrodinger representation, which was built as induced representation for the from the certain two-dimensional subgroup. Um, <clears throat> It's easy to see what that representation is unitary on L2 over uh, the Euclidean space, just because, again, it has two components. One component is shift on com uh, coordinate, when uh, shift, uh, of course, it's a unitary operator with respect sh to shift invariant Lebesgue measure. And second is uh, part is multiplication by certain unimodular complex number. Uh, that is, uh, of course, uh, again, unitary, because multiplication by unimodular complex number does not change modulus of the uh, uh, value of function f. So that two components are produced uh, together, uh, unitary operator as well. <clears throat> The second um, important part, what Schrodinger representation is irreducible. That means, I uh, recall, uh, that there is no the, uh, invariant subspace for this representation, closed invariant subspace, which is different either from zero or entire space L2. And this is, again, easy to demonstrate based on the uh, that two component phase of the Schrodinger representation. First of all, we have here a multiplication by these unimodular complex numbers. In fact, this is a characters of the Euclidean group of shift. And uh, uh, such characters separate points. Namely, you, uh, you may uh, choose properly uh, values of um, S, X, and Y in such a way what this character will get value minus 1 in one po given point and value 1 in the any other uh, fixed given point. In, uh, so if you have two points, you are able to separate them by value of this character. So the operator which commute uh, with such separating value multiplication shall be <coughs> only uh, Uh, be another operator of multiplication. But uh, so uh, having operator of multiplication uh, which commute with the Schrodinger representation, it also need uh, to commute with shift. But operator of multiplication which commute with shift shall be operator of multiplication by a shift invariant function. And shift invariant function, of course, is a constant function. So that shows what the only operator which commute with the entire Schrodinger representation is a constant operator. Now, uh, again, we are going back to the uh, classification of aftermorphism of the Heisenberg group, which we did before. And we recall what there is here as the last aftermorphism inversion, which sends a point with component S, X, Y to a point with S, Y minus X. <clears throat> so this is an aftermorphism. Now, uh, let us take a representation of a group, certain group G, and compose it with the aftermorphism of our group G. Uh, it's easy to check, it's uh, just one line calculation uh, of, uh, of bit of algebra, what uh, result of composition will be another representation of uh, the same group G. So in particular, if I will compose 
the Schrodinger representation of the Heisenberg group with the aftermorphism I presented here. So result will be just another representation of the Heisenberg group. Now, for the Schrodinger representation, we know that <coughs> Uh, it's, uh, it is a unitary irreducible representation. Uh, so image uh, of composition and, uh, with aftermorphism will be another e unitary irreducible representation. And then it should exist the intertwining operator, uniquely defined intertwining operator between these two different irreducible uh, unitary representation. So if we are uh, look. We will look for the explicit formula for this intertwining representation between these two representation. When we arrive to uh, the uh, we will, uh, to the Fourier transform, so tra Fourier transform here may be defined uh, implicitly as the intertwining representation between Schrodinger representation and Schrodinger representation composed to aftermorphism of the Heisenberg group. Or in other words, Fourier transform is operator realization of this aftermorphism of the Heisenberg group. So that is given by that last <coughs> identity on the uh, this slide. And we will see what a lot of properties of the uh, Fourier transform just immediately follow from this definition in terms of the Heisenberg group. <clears throat> well, first of all, we may come back and compare just uh, Schrodinger representation with that representation where we <clears throat> have the, uh, composition with aftermorphism, and we uh, immediately see that uh, the shift mapped by these intertwining operators to operators of multiplication by character and vice versa. Operator of multiplication by character are mapped to the shift. So that is come uh, just uh, obtained from the uh, comparison of these uh, two formulas, explicit formulas for the representation, uh, two representation of the Heisenberg group. <clears throat> Now, uh, the important property of the Fourier transform, which we will use on several occasions, is that uh, Fourier transform fix the Gaussian. So Gaussian has one more interesting property. Uh, so what uh, its image under Fourier transform is exactly that function again. How to demonstrate it? We remember uh, how Gaussian was introduced uh, to our uh, uh, in our setup, it was no solution to this differential operator. But Fourier transform intertwine shift and operator of multiplication, and so it shall intertwine the infinitesimal generators of these two objects, of shift and multiplication. And infinitesimal generators is D and M. So, but if in this formula you will intertwine D and M, you will simply get exactly the same equation again. So, uh, that means what image of the Gaussian should satisfy to the same differential equation, but we know what this differential equation define a Gaussian up to a constant. So, the question is just to evaluate constant correctly, and evaluation of this constant come out from the remarkable identity which tell us what Gaussian with uh, this form where we have minus pi to the x square is properly normalized. This normalization of Gaussian <coughs> equal to 1 uh, tell us what Fourier transform, which is a unitary operator because it's intertwined two unitary operators, should preserve the norm of the Gaussian. And if it's preserving the norm equal to 1, so uh, it's a constant which we are looking here is equal to 1 as well. As you can see, quite a lot of properties just come out from the discussion of the Heisenberg group and its representation. <coughs> Finally, we may state, again, as a consequence of what we did, is the uh, Fourier transform is an isometry. 
is an isometry on L2 space. So image of the function under Fourier transform is uh, the same as uh, initial function. <coughs> Uh, again, that uh, in spirit of that course, the proof can be done uh, using just um, uh, certain um, consideration uh, based on the uh, group representation theory. Really, if our operator, roughly speaking, let's see, if it's not unitary, so that means some function are scaled up, some probably scaled it down, so norm has changed. When that uh, really, if you draw the border between function vectors which increase norm and which decrease norm, that shall be two different uh, invariant subspaces for our uh, representation. But um, our representation, shooting representation, is irreducible, so uh, there is no invariant subspaces. So there um, may not be a function which increase or decrease norm, or function have to preserve their norm. So this is um, just an idea. Of course, it's a need to to be uh, be uh, more accurate if you wish to proceed with the formal proof. But uh, it, or, uh, there is no guarantee what the full formal proof uh, in this way will be shorter than a usual proof for the of uh, unitarity of Fourier transform, but uh, in our context of our course, I think that proof uh, based on group representation looks attractive. And a consequence uh, for the quantum mechanics from unitarity uh, really tell us what we, by means of Fourier transform, uh, has an operator which map the quantum mechanical model where wave function uh, represent the distribution, uh, probability distribution on coordinate space to another model which uh, represented by the wave function with a given probability distribution over the momentum space. So this is the second picture which we obtained by means of the Fourier transform. Uh, well, probably it's enough for today. It's a proper place to stop lecture. Uh, have you got any questions? All right, then uh, please don't forget to register on the course, put your attendance there, and